This is uh, annotations for the poem Poppies, which actually is my personal favourite in the whole group. Um, so the context for this poem is that the writer is a textile artist. So as well as being a poet, she makes things in fabrics. Um, and there's lots of references to fabrics and sewing techniques in the poem. Uh, this is not a personal experience. So the story that she tells in the poem is nothing to do with her own life. It's, it's inspired by the war memorial in her local churchyard. And there's a video on, you, on YouTube. If you put Jane Weir Poppies into the YouTube search engine, there's a video in which she talks about taking her own son as a little boy aged about four or five up to the churchyard because it's high above the, the town where they live. Uh, and she talks about how you can hear the children playing in the playground, which she references later on in the poem, um, and how looking at that war memorial inspired her to think about the sons, the boys whose names were on it, and the mothers that let them go to war and lost them. Right, story of the poem. You've got a first-person narrator who sends her son to join the army, so she describes what it's like on the day that her son goes. She's absolutely terrified, but she doesn't want him to realise this. She wants to send him off happy and excited, so she hides her fear. There's an ambiguous ending. We're not, it's not made clear whether the boy has died, um, whether he returns to her. It's also universal. It could be any war, any 20th century war, realistically, because there is a a reference to poppies which was sort of became a symbol of war after the first world war so any 20th century war and any mum and any boy um, as far as form and structure is concerned it's written in free verse um, it's a first person narrative a sort of dr dramatic monologue uh, there's lots of enjambment in it um, and that gives a sense of time passing and also perhaps of this mum rather overwhelmed with her thoughts, not really able to stop and think about what she wants to say. Um, it's written in a chronological order, but there are memories of childhood, of the little boys, of the boy as a little boy, intermingled with the present as a, it goes off to soldiering as a young man. Uh, and the ending could be later after the son's death. Um, it's written in the past tense, so we're told it's three days ago that she sent the boy, um, but there's a sense that perhaps more time has passed by the very end. You can see that I've got a key here. I've got the there are recurring two recurring groups of imagery in this piece. Um, there's image imagery connected with battles and with wounding being being injured in battle, uh, and there's also this imagery connected to uh, the writer's context of textiles and sewing techniques. Okay, so the poet, the title, totally bound up in our culture with loss and particularly with loss in war uh, because of Poppy Day, which is uh, mentioned in that first line. Three days before Armistice Sunday, which is Remembrance Day, Poppy Day. And poppies had already been placed on individual war graves. And the word individual there reminds us that it hurts families, it hurts individual people. It's, it's not just, you know, this battalion, this regiment, this number of casualties. They're all people individually. Before you left, and you, of course, she's talking to her son, I pinned one, a poppy, onto your lapel. Crimped petals. Spasms of paper red, disrupting a blockade of yellow bias binding around your blazer. So she said, I, um, she's got her soldier's son in front of her in his uniform, in his blazer, and she pins a poppy onto his, onto his blazer. But we've got already some sewing imagery and some wounding and battle imagery. And we also have the word red. And of course, that's why poppies, are, one of the reasons poppies are such a powerful symbol is they remind us of blood. Shed in war, they remind us of the love between, in this case, the mother and the son, uh, as well as being the, the the powerful symbol of the poppies that grew up between the war graves 
in the Great War, in the First World War. Going on, we have this image of Mum doing what she can for her boy before he goes. Um, and touching him as much as possible somehow in a a way that he's willing to accept. Sellotape bandaged around my hand, I rounded up as many white kept hairs as I could, smoothed down your shirt's upturned collar, steeled the softening of my face. So it's a very sort of it's mum tidying him up before he goes, but it's also an opportunity for her to touch him, for her to sort of memorise what he feels like before he goes. The word bandaged, of course, reminds us of the possible wounds that he might suffer. Um, when she says, steeled the softening of my face, you've got that alliteration there, haven't you, on the S, which often creates a sort of uncomfortable feeling. And of course, although that's a C, it sounds like an S. But it, it's her trying not to cry. Her face is softening and she's sort of stealing it. She's making it hard so she doesn't cry. She doesn't want him to see that she's upset or worried. She goes on, I wanted to graze my nose against the tip of your nose, play at being Eskimos like we did when you were little. So was, again, this she, she goes back in time in her thoughts. She's thinking about how important touch is. I resisted the impulse, she says, to run my fingers through the gelled blackthorns of your hair. Uh, and gelled blackthorns, he's got spiky hair. You've got some gel in it. But it's also a reference to Jesus because Jesus wore a crown of thorns just before he was... Uh, crucified um, and it reminds us perhaps of the sacrifice that the boy will make or potentially as he may have to give his life for his country then she says all my words flattened rolled turned into felt these words connected with sewing um, she can't articulate what she's feeling she wants to beg him not to go she wants to say please be careful please don't go stay at home with us we don't want you to go but she can't say those things so she doesn't say anything. All my words flattened, rolled, turned into felt, slowly melting. We've got this ironic phrasing here. I was brave. Not the son was brave. The mum was brave, letting him go. As I walked with you to the front door, threw it open, the world overflowing like a treasure chest. A split second and you were away, intoxicated. Intoxicated means drunk. We've got the world overflowing like a treasure chest showing the excitement that the boy feels about growing up and leaving home and, ma and joining the army. He's, and then you've got the, the contrast between his feelings and mum's feelings. She doesn't cry until he's gone, but after you'd gone, I went into your bedroom and released a songbird from its cage. That's when she cries. Later, a single dove flew from the pear tree, and doves are symbols of peace, and have been since the Bible. And this is where it has led me, Skirting the churchyard walls, my stomach busy making tucks, darts, pleats, hatless, without a winter coat or the reinforcement of scarves, gloves. So she follows the dove up to the churchyard um, and her stomach's busy because she's nervous. Got a reference to the stomach sort of squirming and, and uh, rumbling, but it's she describes it in that textile language again. And she says she's come out in such a rush that she hasn't, she's cold, it's November. But... Uh, again, one of those battle words, reinforcements. On reaching the top of the hill, I trace the inscriptions on the war memorial. So she's thinking about the mums and the boys that have gone before her. Leaned against it like a wishbone, wishing that he could come back safely. She's sort of have got her fingers crossed in the hope that he'll be safe. The dove pulled freely against the sky, an ornamental stitch. I listened hoping to hear your playground voice catching on the wind. So she thinks of his childhood and there's a sort of sense of ghostliness there. And that's why some people read it, that, that this is later and that the boy has died. It is, as I said, deliberately ambiguous. She's not clear whether he's died or not. Now I haven't written down, but I'm going to say now, which one's poems go well with? I think it goes well with a number of poems. I think it goes with Cousin Kate because both poems are about family. Some people say, and Catherine, for the same reason, about family. Catherine's about family and also about growing up, isn't it? A relationship between mums and their children. And children trying to pull away 
and the mums wanting to keep them safe. Um, I think it probably go. You could connect it also with some of those poems that are explicitly about war, because although this poem is about relationships, it is also obviously about war. So you could connect it perhaps with the man he killed. about the futility of war and how war is rather pointless and damaging um, and some of those others perhaps exposure which has that tone about how war is pointless and although it doesn't talk much about those at home it does mention the families that get left behind.